Joe Orth and I are starting a podcast. What should we call it? Mm. Hey, don't pick on me. You know why? Because this is why. Well, let's see what he says. The Joe Show. <laughs> Give Joe the business. That's right. <laughs> Top of Joe. <laughs> Top of Joe. What is happening here? Would you listen? We'll give you a chance. Thank you. Uh... <laughs> That's Joe. That's Rooster. And this is the Together We Shall podcast, episode 33. Look, I'm doing it. Threes, I can do it. What's up, man? What's great, though, is, again, like, the the people that are listening don't know, but for visual, like, because of your proximity to the camera, all I saw was, like, <laughs> I didn't see threes. I just saw, like. Fingers. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, looked like Ashton, you know? He's oh yeah, Ashton. Like, it was a great idea, Ashton. It He's was like, a great but idea. He just looked at his mom. He's like, Mom, they're talking about me. Speaking of Ashton, he came and helped me do some uh some work getting ready for one of our recent races. And it was awesome because <clears throat> when he comes to help, he's he's basically so excited and just eager for just the task. So I'm like, All right, Ashton, here's what we're gonna do. And I give him very detailed instructions. And it's like, go to this box, and this is for the largest. He goes, This is for the largest. And this box is for the smalls. This is for the smalls. Okay, ready? And so I'll throw a shirt to him and be like, it's a medium. And he'll he'll hold it up and he'll go, it's a medium. And he'll throw it in the bucket for the mediums. And then he's like, he's like ready for the next shirt. And at the end of this, I'll tell you, I don't even know why we're jumping into Ashton so fast here, but like it was, it was an hour and we sorted like 400 shirts. Um, and every 15 minutes, we would take a break. He was so excited. He'd go grab his water bottle, crisscross applesauce, and he'd drink on his he'd drink on his water bottle. He's, and he'd tell me it was a great idea. But anyway, Ashton, man, that was a lot up early for episode 33. What else is happening, Joe? Oh, man, you know, kicking it. And it, what's funny, though, is you talk um, about prepping for a race. Um, and the cup that I have is from that race four years ago. And this was the last time, uh, I believe, that we both saw our guest uh, in person. Which yeah, yeah. With your heart in Jacksonville, yeah. North Carolina. That's right. Yeah, it was a great race last month. Of course, we're in April now, and April represents the month of the military child. Would you call yourself a military child, Joe? Um, I guess technically, yeah. But I also wasn't a child of the military during my dad's active duty time. So I don't know. Yeah, that's a great point. I wonder if it matters because gosh knows, like you were raised with the military mindseted father and grandfather and the patriotism and the service and all things Marine Corps was definitely part of your, your days. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it, it's funny, like for, the first, if you think about it, when 19, so from 1984 to 2019, uh, I like always got my haircut on base. Like it was, that's what it was, whether I, and then think about it for 18 years, even before enlisting, like I got my haircut on base because that's where grandfather took me. And it was like three bucks back then. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then you didn't have any option when you sat in the chair. You didn't have any options either. Oh, I never said a word. I, <laughs> I, yeah, you, you did. yeah, yeah. Left hand, left knee, right hand, right knee. I saw me done. <laughs> grow, <it>. grow, <laughs> yeah. grow, grow. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, well, then, with all that said, we got to jump in, dude. Let's get Josh and Mercedes in here. Welcome, friends. Hi. Hey. How are you guys? You guys? They did it in unison. You think they have? So five, yeah. <laughs> you think they have five children together or something? We are well. We like to ask uh, to jump in. Like, where are you all physically located, and why do you think you're on the Together We Shall podcast? You want to take this one? Yeah. So currently, we are located in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Um, it's nice and humid here today. And while we are here, is we've been a member of the Ansley's Angels family for. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, eight years now. Well, no, or seven, was... seven years roughly. Yeah. I gotta do. I mean, five kids. We have to I have to do the math on birthdays and stuff still. But <laughs> um, so Gabriel, our second son, was born with Down syndrome, and uh, we uh, we went to a race when he was roughly. We went to the Ansley's Angels race. Yeah, seven seven months old, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we kind of 
been part of the family ever since we've been accepted and mm -hmm. i think that's kind of the the mentality of the whole organization is just to kind of accept and include and we felt welcome from the first day we went and we've loved every minute of of being here yeah so so you think that's why you're on the podcast because gabe's an, <laughs> a writer because you love you guys love us yeah we oh love okay. the family <laughs> And I mean, I mean, and, and, we, and you, Gabe. you mentioned the military child. We have a couple of those, too. Yeah, five of them. <laughs> My gosh, Joe, five of them. You, I, I'm watching Joe respond when you say five. Reinforced fire team, man. I like it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. that's that's kind of what it is. Well, like uh, that begs, there's like a million questions. So, I mean, like five children, Camp Lejeune, your active duty there, Josh? Yes. Yeah, have been now. So. Just over my 11 year mark, approaching 12. Well, uh, every every day is a uh, a trial to see if I'm going to make it to 20, but looks uh, to be. There. Yeah, you got to go now, man. You made it. Like that's how I was getting out at like nine, uh, transitioning from active duty to the reserves at nine. It was like, all right, if I'm doing it, it's now. Once you're that like day over 10, it's like, just hold on, hold on. Yeah, that's <clears throat> what I do. What do, what do you think, Mercedes? You think uh, you think he's going to make it to twenty? Um, I tell him just to suck it up and get there. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, he's going to so get Josh, there. So, Josh, it doesn't sound like you have a choice. You have to suck it up and get to twenty. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, that's kind of kind of the story of it. It's just, I just I just go with what I'm told at this point. Sometimes, like my wife said earlier, it's kind of like having six children. Sometimes she just has to tell me what to do. And I just wake up, lace the boots up, and walk out the walk out the door. Did you just refer to yourself as the sixth child? I did. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I, I think she does most of the time, but I think acceptance is the first step. So <laughs> I gotta oh, accept wow. it. If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna own it. This is isn't that like the first one of like a twelve step program too or something? <laughs> Apparently it's similar. It's a similar process when you have to you have fire it is. worth of kids. And for all yeah. of us listeners, those listeners that don't know, fire team is a Marine Corps concept, if you will, for a, a team of four. So four people make up a fire team. And when Joe said fire team reinforced, that means there's more than four. But anyway, so Mercedes, uh, what what do you how do you fill your days when Josh is all out there trying to, like, go forth and do this make it to 20 thing? Oh, man. My kids would say I don't do anything at oh, all God. during the That's... day. Ooh. That yeah, that's pretty. Kale will, Kale usually says that to me. What did you do? You did nothing. But I just stay at home. I have uh, a four-year-old Cora, and we have a baby who is seven months now. Six. Six months. <laughs> yeah, I'm forgetting his age. Yeah. It is yeah, six months. So I stay at home, take care of them. The kids go to school here on base, and um. Pretty much just hold down the fort, hold down so, bills and take out the trash and. So, so, so hang on. So, so back it up here. Rocky's barking. Can y'all hear him? My microphone fade him out. You're okay. fine. No, you're, you're good. Okay. Okay. So hang on here. So your oldest is how old and your youngest is six months. Okay. So Kale is going to be uh, 10 in August. And he is currently in third grade. And then we have Gabe, who uh, is going to be eight in July. He's in second grade. And then we have Grayson. He's going to be seven in August. And he's in first grade. Then we have Cora, who will be five in December. And then Dorian will be one in September. Okay, hang on. So to recap, we have five children under 10. Yes. yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, Joe! It's time for Miller time, uh, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's that. <laughs> it's that part of the episode where we encourage you to grab your favorite beverage. If you're tube fed, hey, let's turn on the machine. Otherwise, get that beverage rolling and think about life with five children under ten. And oh. and the kid and the kids said, "Mom doesn't do anything." <laughs> Yeah. Oh, Josh, Josh, what are you sipping on for Miller time, man? What do you got there? Uh, right. So I have to go back to work. So I'm just drinking a Coke right now, but 
I, my Miller time usually starts uh, about 1630 when I walk out the door and then it ends about 2200 at night. So, yeah. but I got to cope right now because I got to go back to work. Okay. Joe, what about you? Uh, I am drinking coffee um, out of my 2020 Angels Angels Run With Your Heart mug. And uh, my Miller time hours are a little bit earlier than Josh's, but I go to bed earlier. Oh, y'all are talking about Miller time like as an alcohol. Well, let's just make it clear. Like Miller time could be any time. Miller time is a time when we're just, oh, wait, Josh wants to say something. Hey, no, I was just going to say, you got to, you, you you mentioned Miller time. There's When you have five kids, there's always a Miller time that includes alcohol. Okay, very well. <laughs> Mercedes. Five, five, ten and under. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mercedes, what do you got sipping on today? A Celsius. Who is not a sponsor Yet. I was hoping. There you go. Yeah. But look, and the reason why Mercedes is drinking the Celsius because it's got 200 milligrams of caffeine. When you have five kids, 10 and under, you need, right. you need that boost uh, to do nothing all day. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Mercedes. I was, up, I was up this morning at four, so I definitely need something like this today. Yeah, it was funny. You said it has 200 milligrams of caffeine, and Mercedes held the she held the the can up so as to look and say, "Really? I didn't, I didn't know that." Two, huh? two yeah. 180, two. I think it's two. Yeah, it's 200. No, you're right. Hey, Josh, g- grab your Coke can and let's teach the world about added sugar. What oh, does it God. say on the back? No. <laughs> Remember, like we had an 30, episode on this. Zero here. <laughs> it's like 30 something grams. 39, 39 grams of added sugar. Which is percent value added? What is the percentage daily there? 78%. Oh, that is your percentage. I quit. You can't drink. You can't have any more sugar today after you drink that Coke, bro. <laughs> He's like, give me another one. From the yeah. fifth person on the podcast. <laughs> I know. Yeah, usually I'm drinking. Usually I go with, with a bang, but I already had one today. I'm trying to limit the amount of caffeine I take. So pre-workout in the morning and then a bang in the morning. That usually gets me amped up to deal with Marines, probably about zero eight, and then they have to deal with me. I crash usually about two o'clock in the afternoon. I'll drink another one. So another bang. Yeah. Oh, thank Those God for three hundred milligrams. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm glad y'all are clarifying that bang is a drink because if you replay yeah. that, it just had a different. Anyway, five kids and I work out, then I have a bang, and then we're like, what? Is, what is happening here? Yeah. <laughs> it's also it, it is a drink. I should have had one now. I, I'll i never forget the first time I had one. I was at a, um, a shooting competition for work, and a um, guy handed me one. And I just went, and I was, it was hot. And I just, probably within like two minutes, it was gone. And then, yeah, the rest of the day, I was like, I, f- I felt like the bullets that were being fired were like cyclic. You know, and I'm like, uh, 140, and I'm sitting down. How does this never again i can't i can't i can't drink them i cannot but i prefer the green tea of the celsius the the celsius are great and then those other ones the i never can a lot a hot newies alana newies whatever um alana new new, bro alana Alana. new but (laughs) wow uh, i went straight rooster on the pronunciation on them (laughs) uh those flavors are great but yeah, I also get research it's like, is that worth that extra fifty cents? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't know if yeah, it is. Yeah, they're expensive. Well, I'm glad that y'all are enjoying Miller time. Uh, back <laughs> to the show. <laughs> so, what? Uh, when are y'all high school sweethearts? If I recall correctly, y'all met a long, long time ago. Tell, talk, bring us up to speed on how that worked. You know. Oh no. <laughs> uh, okay. So, it was. It was. There's a lot of Back crazy, story. crazy stuff that had happened up to that point. Um, but I, you know, well, we had talked about it kind of earlier in a, in a conversation at a hotel rooster. But, you know, it, again, everything happens for a reason. Right. So I had been working uh, Friday night on October 7th, 2005. I, I still remember it was a Friday night because uh, I had to go to a football game. It was a high school football game. So but it, I had to show up late. So when I got there because I was working, I showed up late and I had to stand down on the fence line underneath the student section. Well, it just so happened Mercedes was not even a member at my school, but she was at the game with a friend from the school we were playing. But they were over there walking and she came running up to me. She goes, hey, can you pretend to be my boyfriend for a second? I was like, absolutely. 
I mean, she's a good looking girl, solid 10. I was not going to say no, I, no, you know, I was, I was a single guy at the time. I had nothing to worry about. Yeah, absolutely. I will. Mm -hmm. And so uh, she was hiding from somebody else who happened to be my ex-girlfriend at the time. So the surprise on the face when she, when she realized like, Hey, that girl wanted to beat me. I was like, well, that girl was my ex-girlfriend. We broke up like two weeks ago. <laughs> and so, you know, it was kind of a ironic situation at the time, but Again, everything happens for a reason. Had I not shown up late to the game because I was working, I probably would have ne never met my wife. And here we are going on 18 years. Yeah. And we've been together ever, ever since then. In Joe's face. <laughs> Joe's <laughs> face. <laughs> He's like, what in the world? <laughs> I, I have so many questions. But, like, I don't know. It's like that. This is that turns into a two part podcast at that point. Like, man, where. Uh, he was Gideon's seventeen. Faith? He was seventeen. I was fifteen. Yeah. Pretty much. High school sweethearts. From that point on. Where well, were you guys from, living? Where's high school? We or were. Uh, so we both lived in Bloomington, Illinois. So Central Illinois. It's about, uh, for reference, because everybody just knows Chicago, right? So it's about an hour and a half south, two hours south of Chicago. Isn't okay. there a chat? Isn't there a Jacksonville in central Illinois? There is also a Jacksonville in central Illinois, yes. You know how I know that? An ambassadorship? Rachel Antle is the ambassador of Ainsley's Angels in central Illinois out of Jacksonville. Yeah, actually, Jacksonville, Illinois is only about 45 minutes south of us. So, yeah, it's pretty it's pretty close. Yeah, Where was I mean, it's all born? Monticello, say, maybe? No. It wasn't, isn't uh, Land of Lincoln, isn't that Chicago or no, or it's, Illinois? Yeah. Springfield. Springfield. Yes, Land of Lincoln is, is <laughs> Illinois, but again, we're referencing, everybody just knows Chicago. It's just Chicago. Well, I know Springfield too. Well, I okay, thought yeah. I knew Springfield. But... Yeah. And I, and I know Jacksonville. Yeah. There you go. So yeah, okay. Springfield is almost dead center of the state. Mm -hmm. So. But that is, that's where Lincoln's from. Right. Correct. Is, yeah. And that's where you, and that's where you all are from? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Joe, are you confused? <laughs> yeah. Okay. But we're okay, back. <laughs> back on track. Uh, uh, I'm still mind blown by the by the thing. So, did you say that at one point in that story that like the girl that Mercedes was running from, it was your ex girlfriend? Like Mercedes, why were you running from Josh's ex girlfriend, and, and you never knew who Josh was, or did you know? Well, he says that he he met me before then. I just, I didn't realize that we had met before then. I was unimportant. I was, yeah. Uh. Um, but, yeah. It, this is where the, this is where it gets really, really it, wild. It, yeah, long story. There's multiple, yeah. So her ex-boyfriend at the time was now currently <laughs> dating my ex-girlfriend at the time. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And then we... <sighs> Yeah, I tell, yeah, this is gonna be very difficult. We all on like Maury or something. <laughs> like this is like a perfect like <laughs> caveat for some daytime okay. television. And we're still so there. for so uh, Mercedes, Mercedes, for the confused listener, give yeah. us three bu give us three bullets about who was who. The first one is I was running from Josh's ex girlfriend and didn't know it. The second one is, um. I, uh, she dated my boyfriend, so, and they had split up, and then I was dating my boyfriend, and he was dating her, then we broke up with those cup those people, and found each other. <laughs> okay, perfect, I got it now. <laughs> Is that couple still together by any no. random No, reason? they're okay. not. <laughs> Oh, I missed the part where your exes started dating. I missed no, that. No, they were dating before. They oh, were that's dating right. Yeah. Before, and then they had broken up, and we were dating them separately, obviously. Okay, I and got then, it. Yeah. Oh, she said they were dating. The, she said separately, and then I was <laughs> suddenly about to enter the world of the pineapple and get totally educated <laughs> on that, but apparently that's a different episode as well. I don't know only, that. I, only, I don't if it's, know only if it's upside down, though. Well, it's got to be yeah. upside down. Yeah. Y'all... Josh is like, yeah, yeah, I know about that. 
<laughs> yeah, there's you, you'd be surprised all the all the crazy things you hear living on military housing. There's some wild wild stories that I've heard from. I mean, you got to realize some of these people down here are 18 years old getting married. So, you know, I mean, my neighbor could be an 18 year old kid. You know, here I am getting ready to turn 36, and uh, the worlds just kind of collide into one one mess of the military. <laughs> One mess of the military. Got it. Okay, so speaking of the military in April and all the things about the military child, uh, you all have five, and they're all being raised on base, going to military schools, the Department of Defense schools. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how how do you feel this experience is is molding your children uh, as they advance forward? And I ask it through the lens of you both are not military children, so now you're raising military children. How is how do you think their upbringing is different from what you experienced? Oh, um, so my my kids definitely the the school is more regimented. I think um, they have to wear uniforms, but I don't know if they do anymore. But they they were always wearing uniforms up until this year. I never did. Um, as far as like a parenting aspect goes, man, they have it. All, my dad was hard, but when I take a step back sometimes and look at, uh, you know, sometimes I get a little hot and, and heated and I try to talk to them like I do an 18 year old Lance Corporal. And, uh, you know, after leaving the drill field, it's, it, I've, I've come unglued a couple of times on them, like a recruit. And I, you know, I have to take my, I take a step back and, you know, kind of tell myself like, it's like son racing six, like he, he's going to do things that a six year old does. So, um, I've been very, very hard on them, very strict on them. Um, and so I just kind of have to make a conscious effort to take a step back. My dad was hard on me too, but I think not in the same ways, if that makes sense. It does make sense. Mercedes, what would you add or, or augment what he just said with? I mean, I uh, went to a very private school growing up. Um, and so I felt like I had a very close knit family growing up in school and in town. Um, and I feel like my kids are getting that same thing being on base. Um, when we were out in California, they were in the public school system. Um, and the only real family connection we had was with our Ansley's and Angels family out there. So um, coming back to Jacksonville and the kids going to school on base and kind of having that small knit community feeling um reminds me of my childhood because that's what kind of i went through yeah I think yeah, the, yeah the other main aspect of it sorry but uh is you know my my dad was my dad my parents were always there um but like in the over 11 years now i did two two deployments getting ready to do my third and you know being on the drill field having a, any type of special duty whether it be recruiting msg drill instructor you're kind of gone out of pocket for three years. So um, I think my kids, you know, a, a regular family does a business trip, you know, and a, fa a dad is gone four days, five days, and that's a long time, two weeks maybe. Um, you know, I've been gone. I got extended my first deployment. So I was gone out of my oldest son's life for almost nine months prior to him. And then he's, I mean, Kale's getting ready to turn 10. And this will be my third deployment before he's 10. So, I mean, I added all the math up one time, and um, after leaving the depot, I had seen Kale. He was eight, and I had seen him for a total of 13 months of his life, and that was not consecutive, not consecutive months. So I think that's that's the hard part, and it kind of, you know, I mean, when you look at my kids, think that my wife does nothing, but she kind of has to dual hat most of the time as uh, a dad and a mom. You know, I think that's. She's kind of a single mom in that aspect is to where I'm not around very much. Yeah, I mean, so I can 90% uh, going back to your first thing, agree with you on like my dad being hard on me and then having to like take a step back with the kids. The 10% the that I don't agree is because I was not a drill instructor, but I, you know, I got yelled at for 13 weeks too. So like I can, you know, every now and then, you know, from my diaphragm, like, get that voice and yell at him, and, like, Leanne will be like, hey, you can't yell at them like that, and I'm like, but that truck's not supposed to be there anymore, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like having to take a, take that step back, man, I think that's a lot of, 
a lot of you know men raising kids ac- across the military it's just re- it's really hard and luckily for myself like i only have to like be a, a lot i don't want to say luckily but you know, i'm only around marines now one week at a month but like the way i talk to them is a little bit different than naturally i talk to a five-year-old i'll come home on a saturday after drill and driving an hour and i'm pissed off and something triggers me and it's like god bless so yeah i i feel you on that uh from the father perspective and then for mercedes like the dual hatting is a great thing i mean that's why like at retirements and stuff the wives get flowers and they get a certificate like that's you know the backbone of the marine corps is the nco the backbone of a marine family is the wife so hats off to you for sure yeah, so as as you look at the spouses across our active duty force that are home when they're sailors, Marines, airmen, Coast Guardsmen, soldiers go away to, to deploy or to work for a long time somewhere, it comes back to this idea of like, how do you get your mind right for those things, Mercedes? And, you know, Josh is about to deploy again, as he alluded to very soon and be gone for six plus months so how do you what do you go through to prepare for that that my i pray a lot to be honest um i i do get nervous just because the kids are getting older and uh we do a lot more active things um and i travel a lot more with them so like back in the day his first appointment i didn't really go anywhere i kind of stayed at home and um just did things around the house but now the boys are getting older and you know things happen accidents happen so it makes me a little bit nervous um especially when i don't have family close by to be like oh my gosh i need you to take the baby i mean we just went through an emergency with me not too long ago and thankfully he was here because i was in the hospital for a week so someone had to take care of a new our newborn baby while i was in the hospital um so those kind of things scare me and i mainly just make sure that i'm prepared Uh, we just went to a pre-deployment brief um get our all of our ducks in a row for housing vehicle maintenance stuff like that and then um i pray that everything goes well and that everyone has all their fingers and toes at the end of the deployment and yeah it's over with and then we can just deal with the uh him coming back in because that's also a hard transition too is that the reintegration yeah of him coming back and i know it'll be hard especially now that they're older too they understand that he's gone so beforehand I mean, the second deployment, he was gone and Grayson was born. So they were still really, really tiny. But now they know when dad is out in the field, like, when is he coming back? You know, and that's only a two week thing. That's not a seven to nine month thing. So they're already starting to get upset about birthdays, him missing Christmas and stuff like that. So we we plan a lot to like plan gifts and things for him to already have here for the kids so that way when those things come up um they have something from him so yeah no thanks for sharing that um it's even talking about being absent uh can create a whole flurry of emotions as you think about the the coming seven to nine months but i think also talking about it and leaning into your spirituality and and having a plan um, to, to advance and to, and to see the light, you know, to know that there is a date at some point in the next 12 months where you'll be reunited um, can be very helpful. I know that Lori used to use some M&Ms and every day Briley would take an M&M out of one thing and put it into another. And whenever all the M&Ms were into the other bucket, then dad would be home. And so little tricks like that um, to help the kids process it. I, I'm, I'm glad to hear you're doing those. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Helpful. I mean, and too, I know like the chaplain even said um, that they do like where he can record his voice or reading books and stuff like that. So those are a lot. Those things are newer than what, you know, the first deployment or second deployment because we didn't have those kind of stuff. So. Yeah. 
it's neat to see that you guys went to the um, pre-deployment meeting brief thing because I don't know if it was mandatory, but it's times are different, you know, uh, from your second deployment to now. It's neat to just know that like you two are coming together to like, hey, let's go. Yeah, you might know some of that stuff, but let's go and, and just make sure all the boxes are checked. I mean, that was a little bit of that was discussed uh, yesterday uh, with Rooster and myself and with regard to my mom and knowing that you guys have a plan, like, and now just execute the plan, you know, it's the basics of the Marine Corps that, you know, the four of us know um, very well is, you know, build the plan and just execute and pray, don't stress type of yeah. thing. And we'll, we, you will get through this. Yeah. yeah. We just, I think the other thing, the other aspect of it too is, you know, we have a plan, but, know that, that the number one rule in the military is have a plan but nothing ever goes according to the plan <laughs> yeah so no plan survives have, first contact yeah that's, that's right we have a plan but we also know nothing is goes according to that plan so we have to be able to adapt and um i can't say mercedes does a very good job at that she's she is not like me we are very very polar opposite when it comes to temperament so i am very you know, if something bad happens, short fused, explode. Mercedes is very kind of go with the flow. We'll work through it. We'll get through it. And then, uh, so I think that's, that that's good that she stays home with the kids. Cause mm -hmm. if I, if I did it and she deployed, I, I don't know if the house would be standing when I came back. Mm. Yeah, that's we, cool. We, we shelter halves in the backyard. <laughs> I think though, both of us have grown in that aspect though. Like ever since Gabriel was born, because we got his diagnosis when he, we, I was pregnant with him. Um, so we had a little bit time to prepare ourselves, but since his birth and since him growing up in our life, I feel like now we just kind of like, not go with the flow, but we, it's okay if something doesn't go a certain way. Yeah, So most definitely, yeah. yeah. So you brought you brought Gabriel up, and of course uh, Gabe, my friend, who always is smiling and just will uh, steal a room, all the attention of a room to him without even trying to be a selfish person. Uh, it's it's the way that he light lights it up, and his smile and his energy is special. And I've known him for some time now, but I, I never really had a chance to to fully you know understand how Gabe Gabe came into your into your lives and this idea that you had a a, a test while he was in in your womb that told you what, can you bring us back to, to some of that discovery and journey? Yeah, so it was our 20 week anatomy scan um, and I was seeing the MFM um, on at Naval and um, I just thought it was routine because I have a blood disorder. So I just, it was routine for me to go see specialist doctors um, and then at that appointment, um, the doctor told us that he didn't have, she didn't know that he had Down syndrome at the time. She just said that um, our child had fluid around multiple different organs um, and that he was um, diagnosed with pleural hydrops. Yeah. And um, so that was the end of the conversation at that appointment. And we prayed, I had more blood work done, and I decided that I wanted to move home to Illinois and get a second opinion. Um, there was there, there was some other, the more taxing, more emotionally taxing conversation that had happened at that point too. She, um, she kind of left it out, I'll, I'll address it though, is, you know, once the results came, and I, I think that part of me knew like something was wrong uh, you know, you just kind of have an instinct and the doctors that were, or the, the lady that was taking the, the exam, you know, usually they're like, oh, well, here's his feet and here's, you know, here's his hands, here's his eyes, here's this. She was just deathly quiet the entire time she was doing it. And she kept going over same spots. And I was like, that's, that's not how this is supposed to go. Like usually they, they say something and she goes, uh, I have to go get the doctor. I'll be right back. And at that moment, I knew immediately, like, okay, I've never, we've never had a doctor come in during an, during an examination or during, you know, something just where we're looking at the baby, like right? something is not, something's not right. Something's off. And then the doctor came in, she said, can you guys come with me to my office? And I was like, this is really not good. 
you know, so we sit down and, uh, you know, we kind of got, sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting emotional. She pretty much told us that he, um, she said, I'm so sorry, but your baby's going to die pretty much. Um, and so it, that was a really, it was really hard to hear. And I, you know, he just held my hand and we were like, well, fix it. Like your doctors, you can fix whatever you need to fix. And she said there was nothing to fix. So that's when I, we decided to change doctors, get a second opinion and go home and be closer to family. And at that point, we didn't know that he had Down syndrome. So when we went home and we found out that everything was good, he had no fluid around um, his organs that the previous doctor had said. Um, and he, uh, he just had a diagnosis of trisomy 21. Mm -hmm. So I said, that's great. I don't care. As long as he's here and he's with us, I don't, I don't care uh, what diagnosis he has. I just want him here. And so he did. He came early, 34 weeks. And it's been a month in the, it's been a month in the NICU. And, you know, I mean, as much as I joke around about making it to 20 years in the Marine Corps, I had an outstanding command at the time. And uh, this is back in the day where you only got 10 days of, you know, PTAD for having a baby. And they, they, uh, they basically said, Hey man, we understand what's going on with you. You take all the time you want. And we, we you come back to us when, when you are emotionally ready and you're physically ready to come back. You know I mean? And uh, I had a, a commander, his name was Lieutenant Colonel Drake at the time. And, you know, I, I can't thank the man enough. And my, my commo and uh, my comm chief at the time were this, you know, everybody was on board and everybody kind of just pulled together. And it was that bro definite brotherhood feeling at the time. And, um, you know, when I was at my worst is when they, they kind of surrounded me and, and, and helped me out. Um, Cause emotionally at that time I was a, I was a wreck, but, and, when we got the diagnosis, I remember like all I could do is sit next to my wife while she cried. You know, I mean, I think as a as a guy, you kind of have to be that emotional rock at that time. Um, so as scared as I was and as upset as I was, I, can, I remember just sitting there holding her hand and kind of bottling everything up at the time. And uh, I just went out to the car and I remember just pleading that it was a mistake. Okay. But here we are. And uh, shoot. Now, I mean, you can't see Gabe. But I would like to bring him in, but he's out back running around with his brothers and sisters now. So the diagnosis we got eight years ago where he wasn't going to survive is, you know, I mean, anybody that knows Gabe knows that he's very much alive and <laughs> very much happy to be here. And uh, he kind of just, like Mercedes said, alluded to, you know, he, he changed, he changed our lives. And, uh, I think every parent, every especially every father, you know, envisions a life, especially when you, you get a diagnosis of a child and it's a boy, like everything you did as a boy, you kind of have, you know, the, an anticipation that you're going to do, you're going to get to relive those moments all again. You know, I'm going to get to go to my son's football games. I'm going to get to go to the baseball games. I'm going to get to take him fishing. I'm going to get to do all this fun stuff that I did as a boy with my father. I'm going to get to relive these moments again, right? And then some part of me just realized, like, this is not going to be the same. Like, I, I remember telling myself, it's not, it's not that. And you just kind of feel like something got stolen from you. And uh, as Gabe has become older, you know, the realization that nothing, nothing is different. Like, mm -hmm. I thought everything was going to be different. And it's not. Everything is the exact same. Um, it, I treat him like every other one of my kids. He does the same things. He enjoys doing the same things. He enjoys being part of the family. He enjoys going out and throwing footballs in the yard. Like everything I thought that was going to be stolen from me didn't. It's just, it's just different. That's it. Man, there's a, uh, there's a lot to take in from, from you two um, speaking over the last seven, eight minutes. Um, so I'm glad you feel that way, Josh, that like nothing was taken from you and and it's just different. And, you know, in the words of a rooster, you, you found your new normal. Um, but I, I remember when 
we found out that Leanne was um, pregnant with Owen, our oldest, um, was at a race, you know, recently after that and um, standing in line at the beer tent, go figure, uh, with a fellow runner. And he was telling me like his experience with as a father. And he's like, hey, it's going to just get different as, you know, they grow up. Um, and it's the same thing, right? Like you go from like the potty training to, um, you know, accidents and, you know, then back talking and it's like it's not necessarily getting better but it's getting different and it's the same thing with you know Dave or or any you know angel athlete out there it's just different and you found your new normal and can go from there so I'm happy to hear that like you are still doing those things that you wanted to do regardless of um Gabe's abilities or whatnot so hats off yeah the opportunity to just listen to you all kind of relive, you know, what was eight years ago, so to speak, um, and the emotion that it brings uh, just reminds us about how fortunate we are to be parents, you know, because there's there's people out there who are trying their best to become parents, and for whatever reason, they just, just have a, it's not part of the plan, if you will, and for you to go from that point of, oh my gosh, we want to be parents to this young baby, but our doctors are saying that we may not have that opportunity. And then for you to actually have that opportunity and everything shifts, you're like, I am just grateful for this opportunity to be parent to Gabe. And it doesn't matter of a diagnosis and it doesn't matter if we can't do this or we can't do that. We're going to do whatever we can do. I mean, that's perspective. And it, I think it's at, at its core it sometimes can get lost in the grand scheme of life because we worry about our child making a C on a test and we get wrapped up around that. And then back to what Josh talked about earlier, sometimes you may lose your mind from a disciplinary standpoint to be like, Rah. but it's that moment that we can take ourselves back to that says, I'm just grateful that Gabe is here and I don't care if his diagnosis, that's strong. So thank you for, for bringing us to that mm -hmm. that moment, that takeaway. I think there's yeah. someone out here listening that, that that's gonna really help. Thank you. Yeah, and the like, the vulnerability from, you know, talk about Josh, like being the rock, he's this large human, you know, who's getting emotional on a, on a podcast and mom's standing there, you know, stoic, if you would, is, that's cool because like Richard says, like you should cry every day and, you know, let it out and that's hard for for men i i know for me in a similar ish experience with owen being six weeks early in the nicu and and everything like that and i had to hold it together for leanne and like i remember one day um running just sprints you know i had to get out of the room and work out and release them just i was just running sprints in the par up the parking garage and like i got to the top one time and like it just it hit me like shit okay this is this is different right now uh, i don't know what's what this is going to bring and we we're like day three into the uh, journey um and yeah so it's like men i think and we've talked about it a lot like the mental health and like being able to talk to people so same thing with those listeners like don't don't bottle it up it's not it's not healthy you gotta let it out you do Josh, you, you were talking about how you were stoic and how you were there for Mercedes and you were strong for her. Have, Mercedes, have you had opportunities over the past eight years to be there for Josh, for Josh to just extremely become a puddle in your lap? <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't say so much of a puddle, but um, there have been times and moments um, where I've held the fort down with the kids in the house and while well, he just took time for himself to kind of <clears throat> find himself again. So sometimes we need that um, and we need people to pull us back. I mean, I, I tend to be the person that pulls you back and centers you Yeah. Um, when we get to our lowest lows. So you've definitely been my rock and I feel like I, I've tried to be. No, yeah, she, she is. There's there's nothing else I'd rather come home to after a hard day of work and just have 
somebody to just unload all my frustration or all my emotions on. And Mercedes does a very good job of kind of bringing me back centered every day. And I just come come home, and, you know, crack open a beer, talk to her. It's been, it's it's just something about our relationship has just worked. I, I, it's hard to put on what it is, but we just well, talk I, to each other so well. Yeah, and I think we've also gotten better at to, I mean, since Gabriel, I, I feel like my transition as a person has definitely changed. So once Gabriel came, my look on life is just different. I see things differently. Like I, well, and I try to see it in multiple different ways because not everybody obviously sees the world the same way. So when he's having problems or issues or the kids are having problems and issues, I make sure that I say, well, look, this is how this person may see it, or this is how you may see it, and this is how I may see it. But we have to remember that, you know, we all see it differently. We all see the light differently. And we all need to remember that so we can't, um, you know, make decisions or get upset or, you know, do something rational that, you know, may, you may go crazy. You're right. Irra- irrational. irrational yeah, yeah sorry but well, there, 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 see, there, he's there for me <laughs> the reason that i asked the question the way that i did is because i think too often men feel like they cannot re- you know be emotional or release those those feelings of what we sometimes call weaknesses um to those who love us and it's been my journey that when i have found the strength to be vulnerable and to reach out to Lori to to hold me and to let me just be a puddle in her lap, if you will, that that actually firms and strengthens our relationship because it not only allows me to put my trust in her, but she can feel that I'm putting my trust in her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that that's something that I think if if you're a guy and you're listening to this and you feel like, yeah, this this is some it's really emotional stuff and why are they talking about this well i think the reason that we're talking about is to reinforce that it's okay to trust your partner to be there for you yeah yeah right. that's that's probably the most important thing i've taken away the way i was raised the way most men you know our age were raised is you are not supposed to show emotion don't don't show emotion and like that's how I was brought up and I you know I do it there's there's certain moments in your life that it's okay there's and people have people are like Mercedes said people experience differences in life like very few people have experienced what we have had and we have you know we've had to kind of bottle up those emotions at times but it's okay to let them out and it's it's a it's a circumstance in life that not a lot of people go to so it's 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 okay to not be so stuck all the time Mm -hmm. to your point like while you all experienced uh, having a special needs child come into your life there's so many other things that we as humans experience that it's okay to not be stoic Mm -hmm. i got it if you're the type of person that just doesn't feel comfortable being emotional around other people like i understand i'm not judging you for that but what i'm offering is an invitation because when you can be emotional with another human and to have another human feel you, touch you, hold you, it makes the release that much more therapeutic, in my opinion. And this is from the vantage point of somebody who has been isolated in his in his vulnerabilities and also has also had the chance to be with someone that I love with my vulnerability. And, and the latter is so much more powerful. So it's an invitation, that's all. I think it's also like, Important to <clears throat> important to know that you can figure that out at, at any point in your life journey. I mean, 38 years old, and I'm just now starting that. You know, I would say within the last six months is when I have slowly started to make steps forward to do those things and better those things. I mean, <laughs> I never in my wildest dreams would have thought that I would have a journal, (laughs) you know, Uh, not just any journal, the best journal ever, um, because it's nice and organized, but 
every day when I get to write in this thing, and it's only been seven days, like, I feel better, you know? And at some point, like, for me, my goal is to still use this and write it down, but then be able to uh, vocalize what's in there. Um, so, like, I'm kind of taking some baby steps approach to, to everything you guys have just talked about. Like, I'm going to write it down, keeping it in, but keeping it out, and then have that that conversation. Uh, I mean, recently I've had definitely some conversations over the years, but like few and far between do I let emotions out. So um, that's just for everyone out there. Like you're never too young or too old to to start. Yeah, dude, solid man. And, and hats off to you for grabbing that journal and starting to write in the best journal ever. Uh, for those of you that can't see the title on the journal from the manufacturer is the best journal ever. But I think it is the best journal ever, Joe, because it's your journal. Yeah. You know? And there's going to be people that hear this and they're going to be very surprised to hear that you're that you're writing. Um, yeah. At the same time, I, I think that could be an eye opener to say, yeah, it, maybe there's some there there. Yeah. I don't know if, uh, if he's a, a subscriber to the podcast, but uh, shout out to Matt Golden for unknowingly pushing me to do so and mm. him and i have talked about it offline yeah. but. well so a minute ago you talked about you know six months ago is when you started to lean into that of course anybody who knows you and the life journey knows that there's you've had some significant events occur uh the loss of your father and, and you know, you know your, your father-in-law and other things that have happened in your life and ryan Mannion was on episode 31 with us and talked about the knock at the door and she, too, is a military child. I uh, grew up with her dad being a Marine and her brother, Travis, dying in combat. But she talks about this knock at the door. And um, that knock doesn't necessarily have to be a military family getting a knock at the door with a chaplain and an officer to provide the, the worst news of your life to you. It can be a knock at the door that is a hurdle that you happens to you, whether that's the loss of a parent, loss of a loved one. You know, in some fact, I mean, knock at the door can be getting laid off from your job after 27 years. So it's what do you do when you get your knock at the door? What do you do? And are you prepared for it? You know. Like, yeah, I, that, and I think we Josh, talked about it. I was going to say, I think Josh was about to come in with his knock at the door moment when. No, and no. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just. Uh, he looked like he had some. He, he was like, "Sir, recruit, recruit, recruit! All this permission to speak, sir." No, I just. I, I feel like you know, like to, to your point, it's it can be anything, and I think uh, I looked at my wife because. Being prepared for the knock is, is is having the significant other, and if you have that strong relationship, it, it it almost feels like you take on the world. Doesn't matter what the knock is, like you said, Richard. Mercedes is there, and I'm there for her. I feel like we we can accomplish anything as long as it doesn't matter when the knock comes, what it is, as long as we have each other, we're going to be okay. Yeah, Ryan said there was a guy who was 80 something years old at one of her recent speeches and came to her afterwards and said, you know, you talk about this knock at the door. I've never had a knock in my life. I've never had a knock at the door. And her response was to basically say, you're, 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 it's coming. You're lucky so far, but it's coming. And are you prepared? And that's the point. Joe, you were going to say something. I, well, I was going to say the sound side, the same thing that both of you just said, because my recent knock, if you would, or email that said, call me you know, said it's your dad. Um, we were prepared. Um, I mean, been prepared for that for probably 10 years with him, but uh, that tough SOB, you know, kept ticking. Um, but that was, that was a shock. Like that was, didn't think that was happening. I mean, 12 hours prior to that was life as, as usual. Um, so to get that, that knock was, shocking to to say the least but you know and again just discussed briefly yesterday you know the preparation that we had we being uh you know the family and my mom and i specifically like just went to the went to the checklist basically preparation is key i think that's just for everything in life but that's also well, you said preparation is key, and, and earlier in the podcast, we were talking about how you were happy that they went to the pre-deployment briefing, and then you said, I don't know if it's mandatory, and, and I wrote on a piece of paper, it said, the mu, the mu is a different world, and you better believe it was mandatory. <laughs> <laughs> 
So for yeah. all the listeners, a MU is a Marine Expeditionary Unit. You basically take 2,000 Marines and you spread load them across three ships mm-hmm. and you go forth and, and become an amphibious ready force for America's 911 call. And that's where Josh is heading for the second time in as many years to go back on a, a, a ship or maybe be a expediter somewhere in Europe um, mm-hmm. to facilitate uh, amphibious operations. Mm-hmm. So thank yeah. you for that, uh, Josh. Thank you for, for doing that and being part of the America 911 force and, and Mercedes, thank you for giving him the strength to go forth and and trust that you got the cog back at the house. Yeah, yeah. This would be, yeah. This is actually number three. This would be mu number three. In as many That's, years. In in yeah. well three and. Yeah, three and ten years. Yeah, three and ten. Okay. Yeah. So, so all I, your deployments have been mu's. Yeah, all three. That's crazy. You get Marines that like wait. I never did a mu. Uh, you get Marines that like, that's all they want to do. And they wait a career or a lifetime and maybe never get it. Yeah. yeah three and 10. That's Catch 22, I guess, but. It's been, I've been, I've been fortunate, you know, it's, I can honestly say again, everything happens for a reason. And uh, who knows what that reason is right now, but it'll unfold before our eyes in the next year or two. And then we'll be off to our next adventure, hopefully uh, in the Midwest somewhere. We'll, we'll see. I'm wait, anxiously awaiting orders. What, what does the Midwest have for a uh, for a Marine of your caliber and expertise? Oh, well, um, I, I'm trying to do the hidden gym in the Marine Corps. Is, uh, I'm trying to go be an assistant Marine officer instructor at one of the colleges. So uh, I put in my package the other week, and uh, my colleges right now consist of Notre Dame University, Wisconsin U, and uh, College of the Holy Cross. So if uh, the Marine Corps sees fit and likes me in any one of those hopefully we'll be going to to one of them well, who's gonna talk in south bend yeah yeah south bend would be yeah. great i'm a huge notre dame football fan too so if i get to go work there and i get a couple uh season tickets to football games i'll take <laughs> hey josh yeah uh, dude you just found a best friend uh i'm not gonna be able to separate josh and joe because he <laughs> this kid man look dude yeah. notre dame yeah, Thing. Should I go? I got, should I go get our poster from the boys? I don't know why. Like no. biggest one day, Every, for all the listeners, you can't hear anything because they're just talking to each other about how awesome Notre Dame is. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So man, I actually. I, uh, one, one <laughs> see, I told you, they, nobody life. can get <laughs> nobody can get a word in. They're like Notre Dame, hey, Notre Dame. Yeah. Yeah. We, me and Mercedes, I bought season tickets after my first deployment. I came back and uh, there was a. One of the NBA stars had a had a kid playing wide receiver for Notre Dame back in 2015. I don't know if anybody remembered David Robinson. David Robinson, yeah. Yeah, his son Corey was playing for Notre Dame, and uh, he was walking in. There's, and I didn't even know who he was, but there's this giant man. And, you know, I'm a pretty tall guy. I'm six foot three, and this guy just towered. I looked up and I was like, God, the yes, this dude is this dude is huge. And then um, my father-in-law, Danny, her her dad was there, and he goes, Hey, that's David Robinson. I was like. I'm not a basketball guy. I wrestled my entire life. Who's David Robinson? He played for, uh, play for NBA. I was like, oh, hey. He's like, we got we got a picture snap real quick, and I look like a tiny, tiny individual next to this <laughs> ginormous individual. Man. So, but it was it was oh, great. Man. The Admiral, man. How, you got to still know the Admiral. Yeah, of course. San San, San Antonio Spur, former uh, U.S. Dream Team. Uh, yeah, David Robinson, U.S. Naval Academy 50. graduate, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. Yeah, 50. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, So that's cool, though. So for everybody who doesn't know what Josh just said, he's talking about being one of the two primary Marines who are active duty that are assigned to colleges as part of the ROTC program. So in this case, he would be uh, really a mentor uh, to the students that are part of the ROTC at those particular institutions. And that's, that'd be a great fit for you, man. Usually it requires a drill instructor experience, right, to be an AMOI. I, yeah, you have to have the uh, the 0911 B bit or B billet in in MOL and successful tour, which you know we we alluded to that already. I did that in San Diego, California. So I think it's a it's a it's a good fit, and I think it would be kind of a a wind down from you know you take a step away from the deployment rotations that that are constantly on and kind of give the family a break. Um, not necessarily, you know, I, I'd probably still be gone and I'll still work and I'll still have a, a busy schedule, but it won't be workups for a deployment. It won't be seven months, eight months, nine months away from the family. It'll be a more regimented three years, which is, you know, with my kids, my oldest is going to be, you know, what, 
11 or 12, he'll turn 12 when we get out there. So getting close to the teenage years, I think is important to have uh, a father figure around for the early teens of a, of, a, of a man's life or a boy's life. So I look forward to that. Hopefully it works out. You know, like I said, you always have a plan, but the plan never goes according to plan and nothing ever goes according to plan. We'll, we'll keep rolling no matter where I go. If it does work out, I'll, uh, I'll get, I'll try to get like four tickets and then maybe, <laughs> maybe Rooster and Joe can come up and visit us. We can pregame and then go over to watch a game. There's no maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I've never seen him. I've never seen him play in South Bend. I've seen him play, you know, everywhere else up and down the Eastern Seaboard, but never South Bend. So that's um, a bucket yeah. list. At that point, we'll all be approaching forty. So I don't think we're going to be jumping no. very much, bro. Thanks, thanks, Josh. <laughs> thanks. I, I, I went into the Marine Corps at seventeen and a half, eighteen, and then I did almost twenty-five years, and hey. I've been retired for a couple years. So thanks for making me forty again. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> I said about, you know, I'm, I'm taking the average age of us. I'm pretty sure I'm the youngest of the three. So I, I know I look the youngest out of all three of us. I think our yeah. average is over 40, though. It is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so but we though. don't do ma hey, math for Marines, and we don't do it in public, so. Yeah, I usually I usually write my uh, my son's math problems with a crayon. And then, you, then he eats the crayon. That's correct, ladies and gentlemen. He eats the crayon. <laughs> No, I'm sorry. Well, this is... I, I, it's hard. I struggle to do elementary math anymore. They got all these. It's not just addition and subtraction anymore. They got all these new ways of doing it. And I'm trying to relearn it as I go. And my son's trying to sit there. You know, my, my third grade son's like, no, dad, this is how you do it. And I'm like, no, the math is math. You, <laughs> math is math. We do like to kind of go around the horn. We, you know, save rounds for all you non-military people. That's a term for the, you're at the rifle range and you fired all your rounds and you can't leave with any rounds. So they ask you, do you have any saved rounds? Uh, Joe, do you have any saved rounds or thoughts as we wrap out this month of the military child episode 33 of the together shots podcast? No, I don't thank you both for, for joining. And, uh, unless it's, um, a lot you know if you want to grab gabe for a quick appearance but thank you I all can, for joining i can uh, i can go try and run and grab him real quick oh. yeah you do that that's perfect yeah. can't promise that he's not covered in mud what? from head to toe yeah no that's perfect yeah she's gonna grab gabe uh josh i uh, hope you've enjoyed the chat today oh of course we you know i mean it was it definitely took us a lot different place than what i had originally thought it was going to you know i mean brought up some emotional memories and yeah, it's kind of kind of great i guess in a, in, a, in a sense and we appreciate you guys having us on here yeah that's like Richard said it uh i don't know when or maybe all the time but like the emotional memories like and for us like this is for him and i this is our you know bi-weekly therapy session to an extent you know getting to talk with others getting to he listen more than anything um and then being able to reflect on on all of that so yeah it's it's just as emotional um for us um as it is the guests sometimes facts sure. very true what's up dude how you doing man yeah, yeah race day. Day. <laughs> he sees he sees Rooster and Joe and the Ainsley's Angels uh, logo, and suddenly it's race day. Gabe, what were you doing outside? <laughs> Rock and Rock roll. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm screaming, man. What's your What's your favorite song, Gabe? You got a favorite song? Yeah, you got a favorite song. Um, hmm? Baby Shark. Yeah, Baby Shark. <laughs> we rock and cool. roll with Baby Shark. I love it. Well, that's cool. Gabe, thanks for coming by and saying hello to us. For all of our listeners who are not looking on the YouTube, they can't see you. So, Gabe, you have to tell everybody hello. Say, say hello. Hey. Hey. <laughs> that was great, y'all. What's your Go name? Ahead, I'm Gabe. You're Gabe. How old are you? Six. You're not six. You're seven. You're seven. 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 Yeah. So that's what I wrote down. <laughs> yeah. See, someone's who's right and who's wrong here. Yeah. Hey, I'm I'm glad I'm glad Mercedes goes and she can remember all this because sometimes I've had to take kids to the doctor's appointment and they ask me these really hard questions like, 
how old is your son? Mm-hmm. What is his name? Mm-hmm. When you have five, I, re- I don't know the hard questions like that. I couldn't tell you. Uh, are, are you are you are you the guy that has a tattoo with some no. stuff on it that's related to your kids birthdays or i'm thinking of yeah. somebody else no not me i, I was gonna know say, what i, I, know, if I have I, friends that do i'm about to tattoo them all on my forearm that way it's like a cheat sheet at math class you know, like, hey, go to the doctor i'm gonna get the q a already every front page of every medical form i have to answer is just gonna be tattooed to my forearm there's some, I have a friend out there, somebody that we all know that actually has that. And so if that person's listened to the podcast, please remind me of who you are. But hey, this has been a blast, y'all. What we usually like to do to close it out is ask you, you know, what, what do you want to leave the listeners with? Hi. Hi. High five? No. <laughs> all right. Yeah. <laughs> Gabe Bye. just gave us all high fives. That was awesome, man. That was awesome. Mercedes, Josh, I don't know. You can both go. One of you can go. Like, how do you want to close out the episode, leaving them with something? You go ahead. What would you What would you say to anybody in your situation that's not prepared for uh, what we have been through? Um, the military life. I would just say to uh, enjoy life, no matter what. So no matter what obstacles or humps or... Uh, things that you might think are a burden or that are in standing in your way, just try to look at them differently. Um, try to look through your child's eyes if you can to see the world or the light differently. Um, hi. <laughs> hi. And then and go from there. Oh, cover mouth. And go from there. So. <laughs> I'll totally wrap. I'll totally wrap the episode out with the wow, 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 wow. Okay. All right. That's perfect. Okay. That's perfect. You silly so, goose. The formal uh, part of the episode is complete. So at this point, uh, Josh, I don't know how fast you need to get back to work, but we don't. We usually um, uh, don't hit stop on record just in case some gym happens. But this has been great. Thank you all. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Say thank you. Can you yeah. say thank you? Bye. Can you say thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Gabe. You have a wonderful weekend. Okay. Okay. See you too. Me too. <laughs> Are you gonna do an Easter egg hunt, Gabe? Are you gonna do, you gonna do Easter this weekend? Some, do some eggs. Easter, Easter bun. Yeah. Easter you gonna get some eggs? Kimmy. Buckle up. You know I am too. I'm yeah. The biggest, I'm the third kid when it comes to that. Getting all the eggs. I already found a whole uh, Ziploc bag full of empty eggs in his bed under his pillow when I was cleaning his room out today. All of this so, yeah. reminds me, Rooster, going yeah. back to Briley and the M&Ms. Do you mean to mm. tell me Briley was taking an M&M out of one jar and putting it in another and none of them were consumed? I do mean to tell you that. No, can't. <laughs> Discipline. Uh, we, Discipline. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, that would not happen here. Have you ever seen the the skits of where like the parents will put something in front of a child and they'll be like, "Okay, don't eat it. I'm gonna walk away for a second, but don't make sure you don't eat it." And then they'll like walk away, and one of one of the kids, or you know, if it's only one, will put it in his mouth real fast, and then the parent will come back and be like, "Where did it go?" Like, I don't know. <laughs> There's no way. I can't believe a kid would touch an M M&M and M and not eat, not consume an M M&M. and M. There may have been an extra bag of M&M's nearby. <laughs> yeah. So we had uh, our our six-year-old, Grace, and Gabe's younger brother. Uh, one time we first had moved into the house. Okay, let me stop. We had first moved into the house. The base housing has these huge ladder-style pantries. And uh, we had just had Halloween. And me and Mercedes were coming around and the pantry door is right off the hallway. And I came through and I got mad because, you know, the kids were always getting in the pantry and they'd never shut it. And I have to walk into it. They never shut it. They never shut the pantry. And it would be like in the way. I just shut the door. Well, one time I came around and Mercedes got angry and she shuts the door pretty forcefully at this time. And uh, all of a sudden we hear, ah, and then, so our six-year-old, had been hanging and he was, I think he was only four at the time, but he was at the top, which the top of the pantry was above our refrigerator. And he was standing there with one arm 
unwrapping the candy and consuming it. He didn't just grab it and stick it in his pocket. This is how I know he's my child. He <laughs> didn't have the, the foresight to stick it in his pocket and climb back down. No, he's up there eating it. And then when we shut the pantry, he was stuck in the dark. So naturally, it, naturally, me. he panicked. And then his head bounced off every rung in the door on the way down. <laughs> And so we'd like to tell that and story. Then, and then, you know how it's, how he's your kid too, is because he was mad at me <laughs> for causing him to fall. Of course. Yeah, we. I asked him, I was like, hey, what were you doing up there? He goes, I was getting candy for everyone. For everyone. <laughs> yeah, everyone. And like, yeah. as he has chocolate all over his face, and yeah. nobody else had candy at the time. So Grayson well, has done a great job of not letting, like, Gabe kind of, you know, I mean, when you have a child with a with a disability, kind of can. It's easy to direct a lot of attention to them, right? And uh, the our daughter, y- y- yes, you, yeah, you. <laughs> but our our daughter and Grayson have done a, a very good job of not only kind of embracing Gabe, but they they've done a good job of making you know time for for him to so we can all be together and Daddy, Daddy. You know, Grayson Grayson kind of does a great job too of you know this is this is Gabe's time right now but I'll get my time I'll get my time later you know? Your time. What, what are you doing? me yeah <laughs> new Gabe did you eat lunch yet did you have lunch <laughs> oh, he gives a thumbs up <laughs> you did? What, what did you eat for lunch. What'd you eat for lunch? lunch? What'd you have to eat? Cucumbers? I always or broccoli. Or chicken. Okay, you're being goofball. Mm Mm-hmm. He had everything. He had it all. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, Gabe. Tell everybody bye, man. It's been bye. Bye. Say bye, everybody. Everybody. (laughs) See you, dude. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Yeah, Yeah. man. Thank y'all. That was good. Okay. Do you wanna do you wanna press end? You wanna hang up? Say bye. Bye. Uh, you know what? I, I got, got enough. Time. He's in charge. <laughs> we're done. This was good. Yeah, we're done here. <laughs> uh, the structure of this building has reached its capacity. Find your people, and if they make you feel sexy, even better.